So I recall sitting in my high school geometry class asking myself, why in the world do I need to know the Pythagorean theorem? You may have had a similar experience in your high school geometry class. And the reason for that is because we are the inheritors of a very ancient way of doing education known as the liberal arts. The Greeks and Romans invented this way of educating. They had two parts, the trivium and the quadrivium, the trivium being grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium being arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. And the point of all of that was to teach students language, to have them engage language, to teach them to read great stories of great people, to shape them, and then to expose them to the sciences and to the arts and send them off to change the world. I'm asked all the time about what's more important, technology or a liberal arts education? And I think that shows a misunderstanding about what a Christian liberal arts education is. See, in reality, it's not either or, but it's both. We are people who have minds, we are people who have hearts, and we are people who have hands. And what a Christian liberal arts education actually promises is to know not just what to do and not just how to do, but whether one ought to do it. You see, while true education does aim at the mind and at the heart, True education can only happen after the heart has been changed. Christ changes our heart so that we might know him and then might know his world properly. So Christian liberal arts education completes what the Greeks and the Romans started by changing the heart first and then changing the mind so students might live lives of wisdom, compassion, and courage. At the Bear Creek School, we're trying to do that, to create students who are wise, compassionate and courageous, who have the goods of the mind to be able to engage the world, but who also love their neighbor as themselves and have the courage to step out and to make a difference in the world. As you've already heard graduates, we implore you, be heroic, live courageously and make a difference in the world. Always remember, fairy tales are more than true, not because they tell us that dragons exist, but because they tell us that dragons can be beaten. Well, good morning and welcome to our Tools for Success event. I'm excited for you to get to hear from our speaker this morning, Jen McDonough. Before we begin, though, let's just open up with prayer as we start our event. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Be in this time and help this time um, just glorify and honor you. Help it be a time that's fruitful, that helps um, give parents just new tools in their tool belt uh, for parenting. Be with Jen as she presents. And Father, I just thank you uh, for her willingness to speak today. And I thank you for her wisdom and insight. Again, just be in this time. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, I'm so glad um, that you've joined us today, and I'm super excited to introduce you uh, to Jen McDonough. Um, I've known Jen for a long time now. Uh, Jen is not only our early middle school, middle school uh, division head, she is also an amazing mom of four children and a wife to um, a wonderful Pete McDonough. And she just brings so much laughter and joy in any conversation. That's one of my favorite things about Jen. Um, but it, one of my other favorite things is just her uh, desire to see children grow really into the individual that God intends. And she does that in so many ways with just speaking truth over them, um, but also having just great insight and wisdom. So I'm excited to for you to meet her today if you haven't already. Um, and I will pass it over to Jen McDonough. Jen. Thanks so much, Rachel. It has been a long-standing friendship um, before either one of us had children. So um, a fun, long-standing friendship. I don't know what this means, but I have a music class right next to me and they were just playing the theme to the Darth Vader um, entrance in the Star Wars. So I don't know if that like kind of gets me geared up for this conversation or if it is like, ooh, uh, is this what my children think of me in parenting? <laughs> Some days, I think so. I'm so glad that you're um, joining us this morning and um, thank you for carving out a little bit of time for us to talk about children, um, how they receive love and um, how they give their love to us. And it is something I am very passionate about. As Rachel said, I have four children um, and Jack is a sophomore, finishing up his sophomore year at Calvin University. Kate is a senior at Bear Creek. So we're kind of wrapping up the school year with her. And then Charlie is going, he's 
he's an end of his junior year and Lucy is an eighth grader. And I'm so grateful that you're investing right now when your little, little ones are little because um, I will tell you, it doesn't feel like it right now, but when I think back, these those were a little bit easier days of parenting um, than parenting teenagers. And I'm so grateful to talk about buckets being full and how important that is when sometimes they can feel depleted or dry um, that you've invested this time and energy. Rachel, I bet you want to give a little shout out to put names and kids in there. Go yeah. ahead. You're awesome, Jen. I thought even before I should start, I should tell parents too that are joining us today, we'd love to know your ages of your children. And so if you want to type in the Q&A, um, and you are also welcome as Jen is presenting today to just even um, ask us questions along. Jen will have this broken up into five different segments based on the love languages. So if you have any comments during those times, feel free to put those in the Q&A. Um, again, go ahead if you uh, would be willing and tell us um, just the ages of your kids. I know there's a wide variety of ages um, here today um, too, so feel free to just write that in the chat um, and we can tell people, um, I can tell Jen, different people that are on um, that are listening to this too. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Jen. Thanks, Rachel. I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, please pop in and and Rachel, I appreciate the ease that you have of please interrupt me because once I start going, I might not stop. So I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know how many of you might be familiar with the five love languages. It first came to my attention actually when I was in high school. Um, and um, it sounds so funny to say loving your children efficiently. It sounds like we're about to talk about like some science methodology, but I love the word efficiently because we, um, we have such a small amount of time with our children, whether it's on a daily basis or even when you think about them, the time that they spend in your home, that where we wanna, we love on, love on them and care for them and we don't wanna waste our time. We want it to be efficient. And um, so I appreciate that, that word efficiently. Um, in high school, one of the things that happened with me was I grew up in a family with four children as well. And I had a really great relationship with my father. I struggled sometimes with my mother. Um, and then I saw the same thing with my my siblings uh, struggled with certain parents and not other parents and you kind of look at that and wonder why and some of that's just um, growing together maturing together but some of it is because their little tanks might have been empty um, not filled in the way that they receive love and some of it was that if there could be resentment or um, frustration and we're not loving each other efficiently. So that was when it first came to my attention. I tend to be a storyteller. It's how I learn best is by stories. And so I have some stories to share with you. Um, if you look and see the overall um, five love languages, there's the physical touch, there's words of affirmation, acts of service, quality, quality time, and meaningful gifts. And so we're going to dive into this and unpack each one of these. So I'm going to start with physical touch and I'm going to start with a story about my dad and my little sister. So my father um, is was an amazing man, um, loved his children fiercely. He was one of those dads that never missed a basketball game, um, invested in his children. Every night he would go over what we called the communique, which is kind of the newsletter that we have now. He'd go over our spelling poem and verse and he really invested in his children in the best way that he knew how. My dad's first love language, physical touch, my little sister, I don't think physical touch even registered. She does not enjoy physical touch. It makes her actually really uncomfortable. Um, so you can imagine that that, that love just kind of missed <laughs> there. Here he loves her um, passionately, but how would she know it? And she loves her dad, it's her dad, but how would he know it? And so we kind of struggled through that. Um, and my, my first love language happens to be physical touch. So my father and I, very, very easy um, to connect. I, I, he would hold my hand if we were shopping in the mall. He would sit on the couch and put his arm around me. He was quick to hug, quick to greet. And we just had a really strong um, relationship because as soon as I feel filled up, and as soon as he feels filled up, now we're getting to good conversations. We're getting to talk through conflict really well with a high level of trust. Um, but Sarah, my little sister, didn't have that. Well, um, I remember one day, and my dad would be very frustrated. There would be a lot of conflict between the two of them. Sarah was probably in, in high school, um, maybe a sophomore, junior, senior. I'm not sure exactly sure, but she happened to be on the couch, and her feet were up on the couch, and my dad was on the other side of the couch, and he just put his hand on her foot. And she goes, oh, dad, will you rub my feet? 
Um, and that was like an okay thing to do. It was further, it was far away. My dad was happy to rub her feet, to love on his little girl this way. Um, and she was like, this is safe. This is like, you're a far enough distance away from me. This doesn't feel like you're trying to give me a hug or anything. And it really started to change the dynamic between my sister and my dad. My dad says, oh, I wish I would have known that sooner to honor kind of what her boundaries are or honor that it's uncomfortable for her. And Sarah, my little sister, now my father has since passed away, said, I wish I would have known that sooner so that I could understand how he was trying to love me um, because I want to accept it. Um, but I also want him to understand where I'm coming from. And I'll come back to her because she does have a different love language. I do think with physical touch, um, it for us in our family, so my husband and I, both of ours is physical touch. So we're always holding hands, um, arms around each other, quick to give hugs. Um, and, and our children witness that sometimes actually tease us and think that we flirt too much. And, and that's okay. I'm glad that they're seeing a healthy um, physical relationship. But um, we're, our, our tanks are filled all the time. Um, and so it, it's a very easy love language for us to have. It doesn't cost us anything. Um, it's not uncomfortable for us. But for those that it was, like my sister, it was awkward. And she even asked when she was pregnant with her first, she said, Jen, what am I going to do? It, it, he's going to want to hug and cuddle, and I'm just not a cuddler. So I said, if if we love our children and that happens to be their first love language, we've got to put ourselves in an awkward position to practice, um, to get uncomfortable with it. And then even to like, let's call it, let's say, I'm loving you by hugging you. I'm loving you by giving you a high five um, so that our children can start to identify, hey, my this is my parent loving me. Um, so I, I would say with um, physical touch, practice, 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 um, whether that's um, a, a handshake or a high five or a side hug or whatever is going to get you a little bit comfortable. My sister actually used a stuffed bear um, to try to get used to like cuddling and, and, and making sure it was okay to be um, physical. I think it needs to be intentional, especially as our children grow older or if they don't see it coming, we can provoke our children. So I do think we need to be careful about that. Um, my children happen to be all four pretty physically affectionate um, kiddos as they've gotten into teenagehood. It is very much on their terms. So I have to be careful about that. Um, my son just told me the other day as I was unpacking the love languages with my children, um, my younger son said, I can handle a hug, but please don't give me kisses on the head anymore. And I, I took my broken heart off the floor and um, thought, okay, I love him enough that I'm going to just give him lots of hugs. And then maybe I'll give like a kissy emoji on the phone or I'll blow him a kiss, but I want to honor um, what his request is. So being really intentional about what does that physical touch look like? And then it's consistent. If your love language isn't physical touch, you almost have to like schedule it. I need to remember to give a hug in the morning. I need to remember at night when I'm tucking them in to rub their feet. Um, I need to just, when I'm cooking dinner and they want to talk to me, I want to just give them a, a high five or, hey, will you put your hand on my shoulder and, and let's just kind of talk them and walk or whatever it might be. So being really consistent with that and intentional. That's physical touch. And, and I know that maybe some um, questions will come up, but uh, is, is there anything there, Rachel, that I need to stop before I go on to the next one? No, I just love that, Jen. I think um, your reminder, too, of what maybe may not be your strongest love language might be your child's. And so just looking out for that and trying to be aware of that and trying to find um, times where you can demonstrate that. Um, and Jen also has included, this is um, in our resources today and it's in the chat if you wanted to download this, um, but it just has some list of different ways with physical touch that you can um, do different things with your kids if that's not your natural one, but you know that might be more of your child's love language. So um, those are all such wonderful things, Jen, that you said. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. And so far, no questions in the chat about that, but really good information about different ages of students, a variety of both preschool and older students, um, people with older students. So I love that everyone's joining us today. So thank you again. Thanks, Rachel. Um, and that's a good reminder. The resource, uh, the little PDF that was in, um, that was provided, is it's a great little snapshot. There's also, and um, I didn't put this in the PowerPoint, I should have, but there's a book out there, The Five Love Languages of Children. This is where I'm pulling this from. There's also The Five Love Languages of Teens, which I'm pouring over <laughs> um, as I'm trying to figure out my kids still all these years later. But The Five Love Languages of Children is where that came from. And there is, a um, if you are just like, what are love languages? I've never even heard of this. There's a lot of online resources resources, especially um, when you think about trying to analyze a two, three, four-year-old and what their love language is. There are some little 
tests and things like that that you can access. Um, so that's physical touch. And the next one is words of affirmation. So uh, the, the first story that comes to mind um, with words of affirmation is uh, I've been supervising teachers for a lot of years and several years ago I was supervising a teacher and doing all the things that I thought were the right things like leaving um, little gifts for her, making sure she had support, um, wanting to be in there to observe her, to make sure she knew that I was supporting her and um, and and caring about what she was doing. Um, I think I even maybe gave her a bonus one year and I and I didn't really get a whole lot back from her of like, is this working or do we have a relationship here? I'm kind of feeling like I'm not hitting the mark here. Um, and I don't know what inspired me, but one day I did write her a pretty detailed note of all the specific things I appreciated about her. It wasn't an email, it was a, it was a handwritten note. And I gave it to her in the morning and in the afternoon she came to my office in tears and just said, Jen, this means so much to me. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. And I thought, oh my word, if I'd known this, I would have done this a lot sooner. I don't wanna withhold the love and affection that I have for others. But for her, the, the gifts and the time in there, um, the hugs I would give her just weren't as meaningful as the, the, the words that were used that hopefully poured over her and were affirming of what she already believed to be true about herself. Another story that comes to mind and is in the five love languages is about a young boy um, when he was in, I think it was in sixth grade, the teacher ran through a practice that a lot of teachers will do where they have a piece of paper on a child's desk and they ask every child to rotate through and write one affirming message to the student. So in theory, at the end of the time, you'd have 18 or 20 um, messages from your classmates about you. So like, I appreciate your strength or you have a great sense of humor or whatever it might be. So. Fast forward several years later, and this was a student who was a soldier and was um, killed in the line of battle. And um, so several of his classmates from long ago came to the funeral. And um, at the funeral, the mom pulled out the note from his sixth grade year with all the words, ugh, makes me want to cry, from all these students saying what they appreciated. All these years, he kept it in his wallet because it meant so much to him. So then I think about my daughter and when we were rearranging her room several years ago, one of the first things she did was decorate her wall. And what did she decorate it with? All the little messages I had put in her lunchbox, all the notes from her teachers when they did little prayer cards for her, any of the, um, the uh, what do they call it, the, the grams from the grandparents when they would write little, um, I can't remember those what they're grisly called. Grams. Just yeah. grams. Just grams. Yeah. grams. Thank you. grams. And those were all over her wall. And my husband and I both looked at like, this is really important to her um, that she has these words washing over to her. She's proud of the things that people have affirmed in her life. And here's the deal, whether we do it or someone else does it, people will speak into the lives of your children. And I want my voice through my father, God, hopefully speaking to be the loudest, to be the truest and to be the most, um, the one that they would draw upon or my husband's. I don't want it to be their peer saying saying things to them that could be lies um, and that could be um, not affirming um, but actually kind of breeds some insecurity. So if that voice can be poured over them, whether I am writing it or saying it to them, um, I think it is really important and it starts from a young age. When I unpacked with my kids and said, hey, I'm going to be doing this, what do you remember about love languages? And of course, my girls are incredible verbal processors. So they're talking through and remember this and remember this. And um, Kate, my daughter, who's a senior said, mom, remember to tell the parents to say the things, to say, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. Because that, she said, that's what I draw upon. And we used to say this thing to our children of, um, in, in relationships, um, you know, that there has to be a high level of trust. And when there's a high level of trust, things can go forward. And when things go forward, good things happen. And so she was just repeating so many of the lines that we said um, that were poured over her. And and in some of it, Pete and I go, I don't even remember saying that, you know, or I didn't, I didn't know you were listening, um, but they are, and they're soaking it in. And it, it, it's like, as much as we want to give them great protein and make sure that they're drinking enough water and making sure that their clothes fit and are comfortable, that is words of affirmation pouring over them, beginning their day and ending their day. We ended our day um, with a prayer. My, my husband just sent it to them this morning um, in a chat saying, um, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. He is for you. So when they feel like everything's against them or when they're little and they have a bad day, knowing that their family is for them, that Jesus is for them.
um, I think is important. Again, if this is not one of your top ones for me because of that teacher story, I and I don't want anything to be trite or forced, but I make it very much a, um, a matter of writing notes now to teachers um, and, and to my kiddos too. We have a son at college and we're making sure that we're writing notes, but we've had to be intentional about it. Um, I've even had, so, so, you know, Pete and I, when we're working through things, sometimes, you know, I'll make dinner or um, I'll clean the kitchen and I won't hear the thank you. So I'll write a little note and just say, hey, will you sign right here? I think this is how you're feeling. And we have some fun with it, which I think is an OK thing to do as well. But um, words of affirmation, practice it, be intentional and be consistent, um, making sure that you're saying saying the right the right things to your kiddos. I think the other thing of tearing kids down um, or saying things that they don't have control over. So when we say, you're so beautiful, you're so smart, um, those are things that a kiddo doesn't have control over. But when you say, when you smile, it comes through your eyes. That's amazing. Or when you say, ooh, you are a hard worker. That was a tough problem. Or you helped mama with the laundry. Boy, you have perseverance. Um, or um, that painting. I don't know exactly what you painted, but it looks super creative. Those are things that we're pouring over our kiddos that they have control over. And I think that's an important part um, of words of affirmation as well. So much to talk about, but I know that we have to be sensitive to time. So Rachel, anything come in on that one? No, no questions on that, but Jen, just so beautiful. I can just listen to you this whole, <laughs> whole day. You keep talking, it's so good, it's so okay. good. So thank you, Jen. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm glad you don't see me too close because I keep getting teary eyed because I love my children and sometimes, um, you know, you so desperately want them to know it. And so, um, so grateful that we're in community together and that we're working through this. Um, the next one is acts of service, which for some of us, at least for me, um, is one of the things I love to do. It's just something very natural that I love to do. My husband absolutely loves putting himself last. And so you at home, you know, he's cooking, he's cleaning. Um, he loves just serving our children, but it's not just our children. Our children watch him serve others as well. When I first started dating him, I remember people, people saying, you're dating Pete McDonough, he changed my tires. You're dating Pete McDonough, he put gas in my car. Uh, thing after thing after thing. So it comes very easily to him and he doesn't care if anybody's watching. So I think he's an excellent example um, in our family. I love, I don't know about the rest of you, but I love it when um, maybe there's a day where my kids have been out at um, maybe a volleyball practice or something like that and they come home and their room is vacuumed and there's clean sheets on the bed and maybe their favorite meal in the in the oven i just i really love um serving my kiddos and so um it, it's something that comes a little bit more naturally but as your children get older there are things that you start to release and let them be independent when i think about you having a three or a four or five year old you're starting to let them help you with the dishes or you're letting them put their own laundry away um you're, you're letting them grow in responsibility which is super important um so i think of my older son who's now in college and I remember one day when he did come home, um, all of his laundry had been put away. It wasn't just stacked up on his bed for him to put away. And he said, Mama, thank you so much. That is so lovely. He said, I know I can do it and I'm happy to do it, but every once in a while, it's just so nice when you do it. And I thought, you know what? I'm 47 and I still love it if my mom comes over and does something for me. You know, it's it's just a little something. So I do think um, acts of service, when we talk about being intentional, you know, when we think about getting up in the day, whether you're mom or dad, you're probably your day is going to include cooking, cleaning, driving kids back and forth, um, giving bath time, making sure all their needs, reading out loud to them, making sure all their needs are met, which is beautiful. But when we can be even more intentional and say, you know what I did for you, sweetheart, today? I wanted you to know that I um, cleaned out your toy box. I know normally you do it, but I wanted to do that for you today. Now, a three-year-old might look at you and, and think nothing of it, but you're starting that conversation and you're starting those truths being spoken over them. It's also recognizing it in each other um, as you parent. So I want to call Pete out and go, you, children, your father has an amazing servant's heart. Do you see what he's doing? Um, and then th there were times too when we would, you know, they would be clearing the table and Lucy, our youngest, would just leave the table and we'd say, oh, oh, oh thank you for your servant's heart by clearing the dishes. She'd come back and clear the dishes. So you're speaking those things over your kids and identifying what those acts of services are. If it's not something natural for you, then it's going to take practice. 
And in all of this, I would say with, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but take your cues from your kiddos. The, I took my cue from Jack going, I didn't even know he noticed. I didn't even know he cared. That I became more intentional intentional about finding those times that I could support him and love him through acts of service. When I talked to him just a few weeks ago about doing this love language, he said it's still acts of service, mom. Um, and, and now it has to be in a care package or a phone call I can make on his behalf. But other than that, it's a little more difficult as they get older. I'm glad he knows it about himself, though, so that when he begins a relationship and he decides to commit himself to someone for the rest of his life, that he can say, hey, this is how I feel filled up. So those that so it doesn't pass um, and, and it's not not a miss. And then I think it's also consistent. I'm not going to withhold. I'm not going to, you know, if I see my child getting into a bad habit that he can't do his laundry, we might have a conversation, but I want it consistent. Maybe it's every Friday. He's exhausted at the end of the week. That's when I put his laundry away. Um, so acts of service, boy, that can be a lot of different things. And again, the form that Rachel referred to has a lot of different ideas, but I think one of the things is, again, taking your cues from your kids of how did that feel? Did you feel like I was serving you? Did that, did that edify you? Um, and again, you can't use those words maybe with <laughs> the younger ones, but being able to go, did you feel happy or did you feel sad that I did that? Something like that, that would give it a little bit of feedback to you as parents and then calling each other out on it so that your kids can see, ah, that's what mom and dad are talking about. I love right. that, Jen. And I know um, no, so far no questions with that, but just um, lots of fun comments to Jen of just um, somebody in the chat saying totally agree, soaking it all in, Jen. And mm -hmm. Jen, these are just beautiful things. I was thinking how one time you spoke at chapel and you probably don't even know this, but my daughter who's in middle school, she came home and she said, Mom, do you know how Mrs. McDonough knew that Mr. McDonough was the one for her? Um, <laughs> by how he treated his mom um, mm. and how Mr. McDonough treated his mom. And I thought that is awesome to have <laughs> my daughter come home and say that was just a blessing. So I, I love that. Um, mm. And I also love what you said, Jen, about just referring to if you do have a child that is an acts of service, referring to that cheat again has some great suggestions too about doing chores together. Um, helping them clean their room, making meals together. Those are all um, all ways um, that you can help in that area if your child is an acts of service um, love language is their primary one. Awesome, Rachel. That's so fun. Uh, good memory. Yeah, pizza gem. Let me tell you. I, if I could do a whole uh, session on that, you want tools for success, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, well, our next it. <laughs> Our next one is quality time, and I don't know about the rest of you, but time in general is really tough to find, and when you make it quality time, it's even tougher. Um, but this probably is, for me, one of the most powerful um, stories in my life with my third born. So um, Charlie, I, I, you know, everybody has a story, but um, Jack, Kate, and Lucy are other ones. were really straightforward kids. They all started walking at about the same time. Their first words, kind of the same. Charlie was a horse of a different color. Um, he started walking at nine months. He was in the emergency room eight times before the age of three. He said, I don't know how many sets of stitches. Um, his his kind of our catchphrase for him, is it dangerous? No, it's not worth it. This is the kind of kid that we had just constantly moving from sunup to sundown. We kind of held our breath every day, like, please, Lord, keep him safe. Um, and his first words were, I do it. Um, not ball, not mama, I do it. So um, I remember, um, actually, we used to call him Charlie Mathau. He looked like Walter Mathau when he was born, just like an old man ready to take on the world. And we were just kind of a means to an end is what it felt like. So love the boy, but really um, didn't connect right away with him. And so um, I think about a story that occurred when he was three years old. He was actually in preschool. He had Mrs. Anderson was his preschool teacher and he was three years old and I was working part time at the time. And I don't know why babies were asleep and other kids were at school or whatever it might have been. But Charlie and I sat down at a table and did a puzzle together. And at the end of the puzzle, he wanted to do it again. OK, we broke it down, put the puzzle back together. Forty five minutes with a three year old undivided attention putting this puzzle together with me. And it was delightful. I just loved watching him and just spending time with him. I didn't stop to do laundry. I didn't stop to take a phone call. I didn't stop, you know, all the many things that pull on us. I was just his, just him. And um, later on that evening, uh, there was something that he did and it was naughty in nature or, or defiant in nature. And so we needed to, to, to discipline and say, this isn't an option. And um, after we walked through the discipline procedures, he grabbed my face. Uh, it makes me want to cry. And he says, Mama, I love you. 
And that had had not happened um, in three years. I mean, he would say, I love you, like back to us, like, I love you, Charlie, love you, mama. Um, this was him initiating it, grabbing my face and needing me to know that I love that he loved me. Well, as parents do, you know, about two o'clock in the morning is when you have your epiphanies of like, oh, I think I know what happened. I think Charlie's love language is quality time. And that little bucket has been depleted because I, we had three kids in under three years. I, I, I didn't have time. I, I was just trying to survive, but my word, it's worth the investment. So with Charlie, we shifted things a little bit. If I needed to go to the grocery, I'd ask him to come with me. Um, if I was gonna go check the mail, I'd have him come with me. It didn't have to be an entire day or an extravagant date. It was just that he had my undivided attention. Um, he probably prefers Pete now over me, um, which is totally fine. Um, as, as parents, I think we are not allowed to have our feelings hurt, so it's okay. But I see that Pete is completely present with Charlie and present in the conversation and present with him, whether they're changing the oil on the car or they're taking a walk or Charlie's debriefing his day. And you can, it fills him up. His countenance even changes at 17 years old when he has had quality time. Um, and he, he really desires it of his friends um, and, and his teachers. And it's a tough one. It's a really tough one um, to fulfill, but you want that time to be positive together. Um, and, and as things um, complicate in your homes, as your children get older, and maybe they have a friendship issue at school that you're trying to work through, maybe there's an academic issue that you're trying to work through, you're trying to have great conversations with your kids, but you really gotta feel it out with them of, are they ready for this? Do they just need it to be about something different um, so that our time is positive together? Keeping it simple, I tend to be like, okay, we're gonna go to Great Wolf Lodge and we're gonna go, you know, it's gonna be really extravagant and big. And when Charlie is like, hey, can I just have 10 minutes of your time? The other day he said, mom, can we just go get a soda? Um, which I'm not advocating for soda, but he's 17. So we went and got a soda. He doesn't have his license yet. And we drove in the car together. Those are special, special times. So it does not need to be, um, it, keep it simple, I guess. Again, I think it's practice because that was, um, almost alarming to me that I had not invested in him in that quality time. The other thing is that you have the four kiddos, so you're doing read alouds at night, you're doing bath time, you're doing all these things and you're trying to kind of fill them all up at the same time. But with that one, it needed to be just with him. He needed that specific time with mom. So I needed to practice and I needed to be intentional and kind of come up with things throughout the week of where can I spend that time with Charlie? And then I wanna be consistent. I can tell, Pete would say this too, when there's been a long time without quality time with him, we can feel him pulling away. We can, you know, he, he knows, and I asked him, how do you know I love you? He's like, well, you say it all the time, but how do you know I love you? How do you feel loved? And for him, it's not going to be physical affection. It isn't going to be, um, words of affirmation necessarily, although I think it's still important to practice. Um, his is quality time. And then, um, Rachel, were there any questions on that one? Thoughts on that uh, one? So far, no questions on that one too. Um, I love a comment in the chat that said, this is amazing. These stories are so speaking to me. I love the ideas I'm getting about loving on my children as much as I want them to stay little for a long while. You're oh. making me look forward to their growth and loving them at a different age. Thank you for so much for sharing your heart, Jen. You're such a gift to this community. And I love I love that comment and I'd echo that too. I just, when you were sharing too, Jen, it made me think of I one point when you said that I think is super powerful with those kids that are quality time mm -hmm. is just that one-on-one -on -one that you said. Mm -hmm. And even with your four kids, having to carve out that one-on-one -on -one, um, mm -hmm. with a child that has that quality time because they're gonna want that even more. Um, and I found that with a child that we have that quality time is their primary love language too and I, I was also thinking of just those creating those special moments whether it is you know I'm just going to get this special drink or whatever it could even be that that special yeah. new game that you just got that's a new card game that you're just spending with them um, so all those um, so great so thanks Jen yeah yeah no, the, yeah, thanks for those um, reminders, Rachel, and thank you uh, for the kind comments. I appreciate that you're hearing this. I, when I was pregnant with Jack, someone told me the days are long, but the years are fast. And that's really, really true. And it just continues um, <clears throat> that they, the days can sometimes at the end of the day, your tank is depleted and you, you're feeling like, how, how do I give? Um, but just knowing it, it, it goes by quickly and we want to be efficient. We want to be um intentional with our time. So the next one is a fun one, meaningful gifts. <laughs> um, and so if, funny story about this, I, I actually didn't put it on here, but 
No, I do. I have the family story. I'll come back to that. Um, so our, our daughter, Kate, um, who's a senior, um, loving, sweet little girl. Um, and I will tell you, and she knows this, so I think it's okay to say the first three years of her life, Pete and I loved her, but we didn't like her very much. She was one of the most stubborn children uh, I've ever encountered. And, and now I love it. I, her stubbornness is a good thing, but her little, we did not want to break her spirit, but we did want to break her will so we could be in community together and so that she would be a listener. And it took and up at dawn, dignity depriving three years to try to get her to that space. Um, and so, but delightful. If you knew her, your, your life would be better knowing her. She's just an incredible young lady. But when she was in first grade, she was invited to a birthday party at um, Bellevue Mall. And I loathe shopping. I loathe malls. I, I, I just, if I could order everything online, I would. Um, oftentimes people do the grocery shopping. I, I just, I'm, it's not my thing. I, I can do a lot of other things. That's not one of them. But I, I geared up and here we go. Kate and I are going to go to Build-A-Bear in the mall. And we had a fun birthday party. And as we were leaving, we went by the Gap and Kate goes, oh, mama, look at that sweatshirt okay do you do you want to go in and look and she she looked and she kind of lifted it up and kind of put it up by her little seven-year-old body oh I kind of like this and I I thought well, well why don't we get it for you <gasps> we can and I said yeah and let's get the second one it was like a two for one or something like that and she just she just looked so excited to go to the counter and put the sweatshirts up there and put them in the bag and she just had this smile on her face. And at the time we were driving a truck that had a bench across the way. So there wasn't like a back seat. So she sat right next to me. Um, and so we get in the car and she puts her hand in my hand and she just starts talking about everything, everything about school and the things that she likes and the things that she loves and talks and talks and talks. <laughs> I don't think I said anything. And by the time we got home, again, that epiphany, I think this little girl appreciates meaningful gifts. I think that this made her feel all filled up so she could be vulnerable with me, so that she could be open with me because she trusts and because she felt that love wash over her. So um, the thing about Kate that is great is that she doesn't expect it. She doesn't demand it. Um, and she's she's still at 18 years old is pleasantly surprised if I get her something. It just delights her. Mom, you thought of me? And that's what it is. It's, this isn't for Christmas. This isn't for your birthday. Um, this isn't because you've been well behaved or you got an A on something. Baby girl, I thought of you today and this just made me think of you and I wanted to get it for you. And it's just delightful that someone thought of her. Um, and it could be something small. The other day she was looking at a brush for her face that you would put soap on and it like a, a Anyway, I'm not going to, I'm going to butcher what it is, but it's some sort of face care, skin care. And um, I got it for her. She had been looking at it. She didn't know that I got it for her. We came home and I asked her to unload the bags and mama, you got this for me. Thank you. Um, so it can be, and it was small. It was no skin off my nose. So it's, it, it was an easy thing to do. Um, what I love is that when it's specific to Kate or to any of our kids, it's affirming their character, their goodness, their um, their personality and going, this is what I see in you. And so I thought you would delight in this. Um, the family story that I wanted to talk about was that Pete and I, so y'all know that our, our physical touches are um, primary love language. So there were years in our marriage that anniversaries, Mother's Days, Father's Days, birthdays, we wouldn't get each other anything. Christmases, we just, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't as meaningful to us. Now in my older age, I love gifts, but at the time it was like, you know, it, it didn't make me feel loved by Pete and Pete felt the same way. But we watched our kids watching us and thought, this is probably not the best example for them. So Pete, and it was right by Mother's Day. So Pete took all of the kids and said, we're gonna pick out something special for mama for Mother's Day and doesn't need to break the bank, but they, he wanted them to pick out something for me. And then he wanted them to watch him pick out something for me so that they could see it modeled. So I do think that's an important um, part of all of this too, is modeling it for our kids, even if it's the last thing on our, our list. And that, and that means not getting on Amazon, uh, you know, the day of delivery and thinking maybe he'll like this. It's, it's trying to be thoughtful and bringing my kids along for the ride too, to go, um, you know what, wouldn't your dad just love this? And and letting them hear that conversation. Um, again, the meaningful gifts, I told you I'd bring it back to my sister, my little sister, Sarah. There was one year that there was 
um, a store going out of business and my parents were just tickled to go and buy a ton of things for Christmas that they could wrap us. And none of it was meaningful. It was just a bunch of kitschy things that they just thought would be fun to put underneath the tree. And we woke up on Christmas morning and there, and there was just a flow of gifts underneath the tree, which my older brother, my little brother and I thought were it was the funniest looking thing. We just thought it was hilarious. My little sister was livid. She was so mad because there was nothing meaningful under that tree for her and gifts are her first love language. So she and and she just wasn't having it. So that caused a little bit of tension, but they problem solved. And my sister said, I'm going to go put the things next Christmas on hold and I will tell you where to go to get the gifts. And it doesn't sound very romantic, um, but my my mom and dad are like, OK, that actually sounds good. Let's avoid this conflict again. But it actually put them into a position where they have been a lot more thoughtful about picking out things for Sarah because that is her way of getting her tank filled and and it doesn't have to be expensive it's that it's thoughtful it's that it's caring again pete and i had to do the practice because it, it wasn't natural for us to do this um, and we had to be intentional about making sure it wasn't just a, a an afterthought but that it was actually um, something special for one another and then we had to be consistent so since then um pete does an incredible job of getting me gifts and thinking of me and it isn't just for my birthday or for our anniversaries and um, something will he'll just think i thought of you and um, my kids get to see that modeled as well um, i think the pitfalls with meaningful gifts can be if a kid then especially little ones can go oh you went on a road trip and i get a gift oh you know we had a, a tough day or whatever it is oh i get a gift and so you can almost go into a little bit of a roadblock with it where it becomes a little more formulaic and not as intentional and special. You know, for Kate, it was even putting um, like a pretty ribbon around her sandwich in her lunch. Those little tiny things are just made her day. So um, it doesn't need to be really big. And then you just have to be careful about the pitfalls of a, a kid having an expectation. Rachel, did anything come in on that one? Yeah, we have a couple of questions for you. Um, one kind of goes back to the uh, quality time one, um, but one of the questions in the chat said, quick question about quality time. If you have two um, or more kids, how do you communicate to the other child, maybe the one that's not getting the one-on-one -on -one time that you are spending one-on-one -on -one time with one of the children? I'm picturing that one of my children might get very emotional when I'm spending dedicated time with the other. Um, mm -hmm. How would you answer that, Jen, or would you have any um, just suggestions for that? That's a great question, and I think it sounds funny to say this, but my, I will tell you that my older daughter said, Mom, I'm glad that you, didn't, you didn't do baby talk with us. You didn't talk down to us. You didn't try to make it so simple. You had real conversations with us from a very young age, um, and I think be ready to maybe lean into that conflict a little bit, but be vulnerable with your kiddos and say, we're going to try something. I'm not sure if it's going to work, but it's going to take all of us to team up. Can we be patient with each other? Can we try to see if this, this thing is going to work and then call it out? Hey, today, mama's going to spend some time with Charlie. I'm going to fill up the tank of spending quality time with him. And I can't wait until I get to fill up your tank. Will you think about what that could look like? And then let them author some things as well. And even at the end of the day, how do you think mama felt loved by you kiddos today? What do you think you did? And, and speak that truth into them. Hey, Lucy, when you did the dishes, I actually felt really loved. I didn't even ask you to do it. And I, I just thank you for doing that. Um, if they're really, really little, hey, when you snuggled with me while we were reading tonight, thank you for holding my hand. I just felt so loved and cared for and empower your children that they have a part to play in this. This isn't them passively receiving. This is like, this is training that's going on. This is vision casting. This is something that is going to suit you well beyond the days that you have right now. Um, and so I think a little bit of just being real with them um, and then being ready for a little bit of conflict. My, my feelings are hurt or I was sad. I want mama to myself. Yep, you probably do. I get that. Um, let's make sure we get some quality time with you too. You could calendar it. You can get visuals. You can ask them to put some ideas on there. Um, and then and then even, you know, with kiddos watching time go by, like an hour to them is an eternity. Um, but maybe something that they can do, like every 10 minutes, put a marble in a jar. And when you have six marbles in there, it's mama's time with you or whatever it might be um, that, that empowers them and gives them a little bit of authorship. Um, so it's not just happening to them, but they're happening to it and they're in the driver's seat a little bit. 
That's good, Jen. I also really like, um, I was thinking as you were talking, Jen, of even dividing and conquering in your parenting. Sometimes if your spouse and you are able to do some of that too, I know you referred to that earlier too. Uh, and I was thinking how even for my husband and I will do that with one of our kids that is more quality time is their thing, trying to divide um, and conquer in that space too. Mm -hmm. um, those are really powerful suggestions. And then you had okay. another question. Can I say too. something really quick? Oh, Rachel? Yeah. So go for it. So just really quickly on the divide and conquer, totally get that. I will say though, as parents, we need to be okay with our kids knowing that things are not fair because welcome to life. And I'd rather them learn that a little bit earlier. So sometimes when we bring home a gift, it would be for just one of the kiddos. It's not gonna be even. And then, hey kids that the kid received, let's rejoice with them. Or let's say, oh good, Charlie, I'm glad you get time with mama. It kind of switch in the narrative that it's not all about them. Um, and it's not all about their convenience and all that's comfortable for them. Though I would say a two and three and four year old, that's very cognitively difficult, but it starts at that age. It starts at that, not that entitlement or that I'm going to be comfortable all the time that we're going to have everything even. It just doesn't work that way. Um, and I think that what happens is it produces better adults, <laughs> adults that are willing to go, hey, that was their time and I celebrate it. I don't resent it. You know, Jen, that is so powerful. I think you're right on with that too, because it's training our kids to look outward instead of inward. And like you said, it can be harder at the younger years when they might not understand, but I actually think that also helps people realize, oh, different people need different things. Um, I think even what you had said earlier about even using five love languages um, and talking about that with, oh, how do you feel like you get love or receive love and realizing, oh, different people in our family feel loved in different ways mm -hmm. um, is really important. I find that also with um, just personality and temperament too, when we have open and honest conversations about um, those within our family, especially as your kids are getting older too. Um, another question we had too was, can an individual have multiple love languages at the same time? I can see two or three love languages applying to one of my children, words of affirmation, quality time, and meaningful gifts. How can I know which is more important or should I spread my effort equally across all three? Nice segue. That is perfect. The last slide tells us let's keep all the tanks full. Way easier said than done, um, but practicing all the love languages with your kiddos is important. Um, and here's the, here's the thing. Why? <laughs> we want um, we want to feel loved. I want to identify and go, oh, even though that's not my love language, I'm receiving that love because I can tell that, that that's that person's way of loving me. Then we want others to feel loved and we have to have practice with all of them because all five exist all throughout our world, whether it's immediate family or their teachers or their friends and as they get older relationships that they have. So I really think it's important to keep them all full. That said, um, I do think there's multiple. I have said this over and over again, Jack, acts of service, Kate, gifts, Charlie, quality time, and then Lucy came along and she just took the whole caboodle. She'll take all of it and she'll take it all the time. Thank you very much. So, th so that's probably been our challenge is to make sure that we keep them full without it being this entitlement um, and also for her to be secure in our love for her and identify the things that maybe she wouldn't typically identify. Um, but yeah, take your cues from your kids a little bit. How are they loving you? What's their first choice of reaching out to you? Um, but three, that's a lot. That the, the, If those are three primary ones, that's, that is a lot and you've got your work cut out for you, but could there be, you know, could the words of affirmation um, be in a card that you put a fun sticker on or a stamp and that also takes care of the gifts? And the quality time, could it be that you're reading the card together? Um, and we would write cards to our kids before they could read and it would have all those affirming words in it and they would put it up on their wall even though they couldn't read it they could remember and draw upon that experience together so challenging that's really challenging to have to um fill in all of those um consistently but um but continue to give word to it continue to say we guess what when we read that card together we spent such sweet time together plus there was a sticker on there because it just made me think of you what word was your favorite word i used something like that and then you've kind of filled up all three of them rachel are there other 
that was it in our chat. If anyone has any more, um, feel free to post those and we can ask um, Jen those. I know that our time's wrapping up. Someone had asked uh, where the paper was for this colorful paper um, and you can, I've attached it in the Q&A, but you can go to our website and it, um, you can download um, this information so you have it and just some really great stories and I know right now um, everybody listening to Jen is just taking a lot in um, because it's so rich so we just really appreciate it Jen because it's, it's it's excellent excellent stuff um, I think of for my own self too as I grew that I realized my dad was an access service that that was the way he um, gave and showed love and I'm more of a words of affirmation quality time person and so even as an adult, I think that these things just you can realize different elements of relationships you have um, within your family that I think just help strengthen it with the, whether it's with our kids, coworkers, um, you know, all, all in our marriage, all of the above. Um, it's just very rich. So thanks, Jen. And again, this just shows really, um, really great things too. Um, one question we also had in here that came in, it says, is it a good idea to share parents' primary love languages with kids so we can receive our love language from them? Great question. Um, it makes me think about, I have uh, eight nephews and nine. I have nine nephews and nieces. And when they come to our home, the rule is you greet me. That's that's the appropriate thing. I'm your Aunt Jenny and I'd like to say hello. Um, I want to invest in relationships, but we would say what we would love is a hug, a high five, a fist bump, or a head nod, something that was a connection. And um, I think about one of my nieces that it was always a fist bump. That was what was comfortable for her. But we would send care packages in the mail. We would send letters in the mail. Um, we would have the kids spend the night and do fun things with them, spend quality time with them. And by the time she was probably seven or eight years old, she would hug me. And I wouldn't ask for it. And I would definitely, you have to be careful about those boundaries. It really needs to, they need to be able to author it. But because we had said, hey, Aunt Jenny, hers is physical touch. So some sort of fist bump or high five or a nod, something that we are connecting. And she softened and softened and softened. And she doesn't hug a whole lot of people, but she does hug me when she comes to see me. So I think being able to be uh, forthcoming with that and letting them know this is how I feel all filled up um, I think is important but I think the other side of that is what if a kiddos is gifts and they get you flowers from your garden or they write you a note um, or they get a rock and they just think it's so pretty and it reminds them of you acknowledge that and you must really love me you took the time to give this to me because again that's pouring um, affirmation over them. It is recognizing and noticing, hey, you did something. It's almost like speaking that truth, become, be, it becomes real. It's like, oh, I, I just got the rock because I thought it was fun, but you're actually, you're helping them with the narrative a little bit and empowering them to go, wait a minute, I, I did love that way. You're right. That's really good, Jen. Um, another question too, um, as I know we're getting ready to almost close here, but when uh, the last question said, thank you for your transparency and wisdom. Can you give tips for those Lucy's and how to teach kiddos who lean into having a larger cup that needs to be filled? <laughs> Great question. Um, and, and it has been, it's been a challenge. Um, and and she's 14 and we're, we're still working through some of the things that we're like, huh, we would have thought this would have um, kicked in by now. So don't mean to depress you. It's wonderful. It's joyful. It's the journey. Um, but with Lucy, for sure, that last born, um, there were some things that were more natural, like quality time, because as I grow as a parent, you let go of some things, some things that just don't need to be um, that were, were so worrisome to me when the kids were younger. And so that quality time becomes a little bit easier for um, Lucy. Gifts are really easy for her. And sometimes I'll say, hey, I need to go to Target and pick up something. And she'll say, ooh, can I go with you? And sometimes I'll say, yes, but I'm not purchasing anything for you. <laughs> um, and I still love you. Or yes, and you know what? I know that you had your eye on such and such. Why don't we go check it out and see if it's still there? So that that has become a little bit easier as she's gotten older. When she was little, I think a lot of those um, buckets could be filled because she was the fourth born. Her, her, her siblings adored her. Um, they spent tons of time with her um, and they showered her with affection, physical affection. She's always been close to Pete. And so um, she just wants to be with her dad all the time. Um, so, so how do you do that with a kiddo that's a little bit more demanding? I think you have honest conversations and you say I love you so much and sometimes you're going to feel it 
and sometimes you're not. So let's keep talking. And, and it may be that you carve out time at the end of the day. When did you feel all filled up today? When was your bucket filled? Um, mama did this. Did you notice that? Not because you're trying to manipulate your child or get a, an answer out of them that you would like to hear, but really because you're opening a good dialogue. I have to do it now with my kids being teenagers. Did you feel supported? What can I do? What's missing? Have I provoked? Okay, I'm kissing you on the head because it's the most natural thing in the world, but it's provoking you. I need to be careful about not doing that. So I think having transparent, open conversations with your kiddos is an okay thing. We don't want to burden them and say, you know, our happiness is not connected to them. It can't be. It, it just can't. That's too much of a burden to put on a child. But to be able to say, I'm excited about our relationship. I'm excited to get to know you and for you to get to know me. I'm so pleased at the end of the day that you feel all warm and yummy um, because of how mama and daddy you know, treated you. Um, so speaking that into their lives and letting them have a word also, um, I think is important. That's wonderful, Jen. And one last thing before we close, um, a parent just asked as their child gets older and they're more physical touch and they're wanting to sit um, on the parent's lap, like how can I teach him when he gets heavy? He's also trying to sit on his teacher's lap. How do you kind of help that um, with a child maybe that is more physical touch? Oh my goodness, this is such a good question and I can't believe that I didn't highlight it. A big, big thing I want to highlight is that you continue these love languages as they get older, but you adjust according to their development and also preparing them to be in society. So I think there is a, a conversation that you have with that. Um, I remember in fourth grade when Jack was in fourth grade, the field trip was going and I was going to go pray over the bus and I was like, hey, Jack, it's mom. And the teacher pulled me aside later on in the day and said, hey, it's probably those days are probably done. Um, maybe you don't pull him to the side. And you know what? Most affectionate kid at home sits, holds my hand, talks to me about his day, but that wasn't the appropriate place. So a lot of times we talk with our kiddos about time, place, and audience, and what purpose is it serving? So I want to cuddle with you. Here are a couple things that we can do. Do you feel comfortable like leaning on me? Do you feel comfortable um, sitting next to me and leaning on my shoulder? Can we maybe adjust to that um, just because we're getting a little bit older, but you do not, I mean, big, 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 you do not want to withhold physical affection. As kids get older and they're awkward with their bodies, they don't feel lovable. As they get into puberty and they get into like, oh, my body's changing. Am I still lovable? I'm not that little kid anymore. They That is more than ever when they need the physical affection, the free hug, the free kiss, even when they're getting acne or whatever it might be, um, they are not feeling lovable. So keep that habit going. If you have a kid that wants to sit on your lap, embrace that and just say, love the lap. Hey, now that we're getting older, it's going to be lean on my shoulder or it's going to be, you know, leaning into me, you know, however it might be, whatever adjustment would work so that um, your legs don't fall asleep with a heavy kid. I love it, Jen. Jen, thank you so much. I know there's just so many great things that people walked away with. There's, it's fun to watch the chat with people saying um, different comments. So we just thank everyone for joining us today. I thank Jen again for her incredible wisdom and her powerful stories. Um, and I know somebody was asking if this will be recorded, if the session was recorded. It is recorded and will be posted later in, the, in that area that we sent for the link. Um, in the chat so you can view it there. I know another gal, Megan, that joined us said um, she posted a link um, to a place where you could also take a little quiz um, with your children. Um, and so that's also posted in there as well. But we just thank you guys for joining us. And if those of you who don't know about Bear Creek and you're interested in finding more, uh, feel free to go to our website and look under our admission page for more information um, about our school and checking us out. But we just thank you all for joining us today. Hope that you have a great day. And thank you again, Jen, for all of your wisdom and your fun stories. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Okay, bye, everyone.